Hey, it's Darius, and I'm on the CPA exam Facebook groups every day. And I love reading about when you pass and thank me for I-75. But what do you think is the most common question I answer every day? Which discipline should I take? And here's the answer. If you already passed reg and you enjoy entity tax, especially tax planning for entities, choose TCP. If not, but you already passed FAR and you like random calculations and formulas, then choose BAR, Business Analysis and Reporting. Otherwise, choose ISC, Information Systems and Controls. No calculations at all. Either way, I-75 will have you prepared for all parts of the CPA exam. Just go to i75cpareview.com. We always have a special, so go to i75cpareview.com. Get yourself on the right road with me, Darius Clark, because the right teacher makes all the difference. All right, now let's look at inherited property. And the first thing to note is that when a taxpayer inherits property from someone who died, the taxpayer automatically receives the long-term holding period, regardless of how long the deceased owned the asset and regardless of how long the taxpayer owned the asset before they sold it. Often the deceased basis and the deceased holding period is unknown, and that's why these automatic rules apply that when you inherit property, you get the long-term holding period. And when this comes into play is when there's a sale at a gain. So you automatically get the long-term capital gain, even if you yourself who inherited the property only held the asset for a few weeks. So then the most serious income tax question in connection with inherited property is the basis to be assigned to this property since the decedent's tax basis, the one who died, and their date of purchase may not be known and isn't even relevant even if it is known. Why? Because inherited property is assigned its fair market value at the date of the person's death. That's going to be your tax basis if you're the one inheriting the property. And if it's a capital asset like stocks and bonds or real estate, always classified as long term. So here's our first example. Taxpayer inherits shares of stock on July 31st, year 12. Sells the stock three weeks later. Taxpayer automatically qualifies for long-term capital gain or loss, even though they only held it for three weeks after they inherited the property. Even if the deceased paid $15,000 for the shares, if the fair value on the date of death is $25,000, the taxpayer gets $25,000 as what we call a stepped-up basis. So instead of that basis rolling over and being $15,000 for the taxpayer who inherits it, instead, the taxpayer who inherits will step up into that full $25,000 fair market value. That'll be their basis. So then, assuming that taxpayer who inherits that property sells three weeks later for $30,000, a long-term capital gain of $5,000 will be reported for the taxpayer. They'll compare the proceeds of $30,000 with their stepped-up basis of $25,000, and they'll have a $5,000 long-term capital gain, even though they only held the asset for three weeks after they inherited it. And even though they didn't pay anything for the stock, they just inherited it, but they get the stepped up basis, the value on the date of death. So let's try this. Upon his aunt's death, Dwayne inherited shares of Fillmore Corp stock that had a fair value of $10,000. So that's important. It was worth $10,000 on the date of his aunt's death. His aunt acquired the shares a few weeks before death for, we don't really care, $7,000, but who cares? Four months after conveyance, Dwayne sold all his shares of Fillmore for $12,000. What was Dwayne's recognized gain in the year of sale? And all we do is take the proceeds from the sale, $12,000, compare it to Dwayne's basis. And his basis would be the fair market value, the stepped up basis of $10,000, not the $7,000 that the aunt paid. And that results in a $2,000 long-term capital gain for Dwayne. The answer is A. The sale proceeds of $12,000 compared to Dwayne's basis, which is the fair market value, date of death, $10,000. And even though Dwayne only held the stock for four months after conveyance, he still gets a long-term capital gain of $2,000. Now, this word conveyance, very important word, it means transfer. So four months after the stock was transferred to Dwayne, he sold all his shares. Letter A is correct. So what's the general rule for inherited property? The taxpayer who inherits that property, we'll call them the beneficiary. That person 
gets a basis equal to the fair market value date of death. That's the general rule for the beneficiary. Well, when there's a general rule, guess what? There can be an exception, and that's what we're going to have to look at next. What about the basis of inherited property when the executor of the estate chooses the alternative valuation date? So the executor of an estate does have the power to choose an alternative valuation date for property being conveyed to the beneficiary. And if chosen, the alternate valuation date is six months after the date of death, except for property disposed of during that six month period. For that property, the valuation date will be the date of conveyance. This is the exception, they love to test this. And you'll know that the exception applies if they tell you that the executor of the estate chose the alternate valuation date, then you'll ignore whatever the value of the asset was on the date of death. You won't use the value date of death if the executor chooses the alternate valuation date. The exam question will have to say that the alternate valuation date was chosen. If it doesn't say anything, then use the value on the date of death. So it's the executor who decides the one who's been named in the will to watch over the estate and take care of the beneficiaries, the executor decides, do I value on the date of death or do I choose the alternate valuation date, which is six months after date of death? Okay, that's the easy part because it'll say in the question whether the alternate valuation date is chosen or not. Here comes the tough part. If the alternate valuation date is chosen, look to see when the property was conveyed to the beneficiary. If conveyance takes place early, that means within the six month period after death, then use the date of conveyance to value that property. Otherwise, if the beneficiary waited six months to get their grubby little hands on the asset, then use the alternate valuation date. So if the alternate valuation date is chosen, make sure that the beneficiary was patient enough to wait the six month period, then and only then can you use the alternate valuation date the value six months after death. Otherwise, if the beneficiary couldn't wait to get their grubby little hands on the asset, then you've got to value that particular asset on the date of conveyance. Here's how it works. Mr. X bought investment land for 40,000 on December 1st, year one. Mr. X died on December 17th, year one. So just a few weeks later, Mr. X dies when the property was worth 48,000. So there's the fair market value date of death. 48,000. We don't care what he paid for it. 40,000, you can cross that right out. Title to the property was conveyed to Ms. Z. She's the beneficiary. When was it conveyed? February 1st, year two, when it was worth 53,000. Six months after death, June 17th, year two, the property was worth 56,000. Why are they telling us that? Because that's the value on the alternate valuation date, six months after death. So remember, it was worth 48,000 when Mr. X died. Six months later, it's worth 56000 On July 6th, year two, Ms. Z sells the property for 60000 in cash. What is her taxable gain? Well, if the executor of the estate did not select the alternate valuation date, then it's easy. Then Ms. Z has a $12,000 long-term capital gain. The difference between the proceeds, the amount received on the sale, 60000 and the value of the property at the date of death, 48000 That's a $12,000 long-term capital gain for Ms. Z, assuming the alternate valuation date was not chosen. Ah, but what if the alternate valuation date was chosen by the executor? Now it's a little more sophisticated. Mr. X bought investment land for 40,000 on December 1st, year one. We really don't care what he paid. Mr. X died on December 17th, year one, when the property was worth a more important 48,000. Title to the property was conveyed to Ms. Z on February 1st, year two, when it was worth 53,000. Six months after death, the property was worth 56,000. And on July 6th, year two, Ms. Z sells the property for a very important 60,000 in cash. That's the proceeds. What's her taxable gain? Well, if the executor did choose the alternate valuation date, Ms. Z has a $7,000 long-term capital gain. The difference between the amount received, the proceeds, 60,000, and the value of the property when conveyed, when received by her, 53,000. The date of conveyance is used since Ms. Z didn't wait the six months after death to get her grubby little hands on the asset. She got that asset when? February 1st of year two. 
That's only two months after death. So since she didn't wait six months, she can't use the alternate valuation date of 56,000. That would have been her basis, 56,000, and she only would have had a $4,000 long-term capital gain if she would have waited until at least June 17th to get her grubby little hands on the asset, but she couldn't wait. She had to have it on February 1st, and that's why her basis is 53,000, and she winds up with a $7,000 long-term capital gain. It's always long-term. You never have to worry about short-term gain or loss with regard to inherited property. But the issue is, if that alternate valuation date is chosen by the executor, look to see when that property is conveyed to the beneficiary. If they don't wait the six months to get the asset, then use the date of conveyance, in this case, 53,000 to value the asset. Let's try this. Trainer died on January 5th, bequeathing his entire $4 million estate to sister Anna. The alternate valuation date was validly elected by the executor, Trainer's estate included 5,000 shares of listed stock for which his basis was 760,000. Do we care what his basis was? No, he died, so it's going to be a fair market value situation. This stock was distributed to Anna nine months after Trainer's death. Now, it says the alternate valuation date was validly elected, so that means we can ignore the value on the date of death, and we're either going to value the asset transferred to Anna on the six months later date, which is the alternate valuation date, or we're going to value it earlier if the date of conveyance was earlier than six months. We're not going to be able to value the asset on the nine months later date. So Anna's basis for the stock is going to be 910000 the value on the alternate valuation date, the value six months after death. Letter D is correct. So if the executor selects the alternate valuation date, the asset is valued six months after death. The alternate valuation date can never be later than six months after death. It could possibly be earlier if the beneficiary does not wait the required six months, but Anna did wait the required six months and then some, so she earned the 910,000 alternate valuation date as her basis. And let's see why that's so important. The reason why it's important is let's say she sells the stock for a million dollars. Well, if her basis was on the date of death, 800,000, she'd have a $200,000 long-term capital gain. But because she gets to use the $910,000 basis, the alternate valuation date was chosen and she waited at least six months, then she only has a $90,000 long-term capital gain. How about this? January 10th, year one, Al bought 3,000 shares of Olympic Corp stock for 600,000. The fair market values of the stock on the following dates were, and then they said Al died on December 31st, year two, bequeathing the stock to his son, Martin. All of the stock was distributed to Martin on March 31st, year three. The alternate valuation date was elected for Al's estate. Very important. They'll have to tell you if you have to deal with the alternate valuation date. And in this question, just like the previous question, you do have the alternate valuation date. So how much is Martin's basis? Well, and if you think you know, leave me the answer in the comments section. And remember to like and subscribe because it really helps the channel out a lot. And if you need more help with REG or any part of the CPA exam, go to i75cpareview.com and get yourself on I-75 with me, Darius Clark, because the right teacher makes all the difference